All right, everyone, hello. Thank you for coming. Welcome to using file-based workflows with live streaming to replicate the linear television experience. What does this actually mean? We're going to take a bunch of music videos and we're going to create a 24-hour streaming live uh, channel, if you will. Uh, getting into it a little bit, let's start with who we are. Uh, Ivan, you want to go ahead and kick us off? Hi guys, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Uh, my name is Ivan Yang. I'm the uh, Director of Systems Engineering at Vivo. And uh, if you're not familiar with us, uh, Vivo is a uh, leading platform uh, for online music videos. And uh, just to give you some context about um, you know, the, the, the type of scale that we're at, uh, in March alone, we did uh, over 4 billion video views. Uh, worldwide, and you know, 25% of these video views were delivered over mobile platforms. So you're really starting to see a trend there in mobile. And uh, we did uh, 248 million unique uh, visitors worldwide in March, uh, serving out a catalog of over 75,000 music videos from more than over 21,000 different artists. And uh, Rob, why don't you tell yourself, uh, tell a little, a little right. bit. Uh, my yourself. name is Rob Roskin. I'm a senior performance advisor at Level 3. It's a nice title, I know, thank you. Uh, and it, it basically means that I work with our largest, strongest customers on their biggest new goals and help them achieve them. Uh, Level 3 is a company, has over 10,000 people in it worldwide. It is the leader in delivering global voice data, video, which is what we're going to talk about here, managed solutions for business, content, again, what we're talking about here, government and wholesale customers. To give you a quick idea of the scale, we do just for internet video, over 47 petabytes streamed and 1 billion files stored per month. Uh, for sports and live events, more than 10 million minutes goes across our network. Uh, and for music, over 9 million hours are streamed per month. This is a lot of data. Um, but I'm going to pass it back over to Ivan now to give us a little bit about the why. So the, the context for today's discussion is you know, we decided to create a 24-7 uh, music streaming channel, uh, online streaming channel. And you know, why, why do we do this? Video on demand, it's great. It's here to stay. You know, you, you're a consumer. You want to see this particular music video at this particular time and you know that's what VOD is made for and it's great but sometimes you know there's different scenarios where you just want to lean back and and you know not have to make all these decisions of you know what am I going to play next or I want to watch this video and then you know I have to now think about what I want to select next or you know make my own playlist so we decided to create this programming that's hand selected by humans and you know it really sets the tone for a uh, lean back experience where uh, you know you don't have to make all these decisions uh, yourself. And you know one of the key tenets of the whole project is we didn't want to depend on algorithms and you know programmatic decision making for uh, recommendations. Just because you know sometimes they work out well, but we all know in the real world, you know you're like what the heck? You know I decided to watch this Johnny Cash uh, music video and then. Taylor Swift comes up just because they're both country music, right? And I would venture to say that uh, her demographic is a little bit different uh, <laughs> than Johnny Cash's. So uh, over here you see, uh, well, it's a little bit cut off, but what you see is a uh, overall diagram kind of describing uh, all the architecture behind the 24-hour uh, programming channel uh, live broadcast that that we set up. So I mean, it's a little overwhelming at first, but we're going to get through it step by step, and hopefully at the end of the presentation, you'll have a better understanding uh, of how all this works. So you know, over there on the left in the little Vivo building, I'm on the top floor, the window <laughs> on the left. Um, you know, this is where it all starts. So um, you know, a little bit about the CMS workflow. We work with uh, many different. Uh, uh, content providers, uh, many of the major record labels and some of the smaller indie ones that uh, also provide content. And you know, the, the first step is they have access to all the high quality original source content, right? Not you know, the, the guy recording his television while something else was playing and then putting it on YouTube. So we have all the, you know, the original content. And what they do is they send us the video assets and an XML package describing 
uh, the video asset, you know, things like the artist, the title, the genre, the producer, director, so on and so forth. And, you know, they send this over an SFTP feed to us, uh, which then goes into the ingestion process, uh, which uh, what happens there is each video asset gets processed and archived. The associated metadata with each video asset also gets processed into our uh, backend data layer. And, you know, once we have all that information aggregated, we send out those, we publish those videos to uh, various different endpoints. And you know, one of the endpoints is our own internal endpoint, which is Vivo's encoding system. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our encoding workflow and uh, how that works. So uh, our encoding workflow, it's, it's a queue-based system with designated tasks. So there's, there's four main queues or tasks, so to speak. One is the encoding request. Number two is the actual encoding job. Number three is the delivery. And finally is the uh, updating of the data layer on our backend that says, hey, this video is ready to play. So here's a, a small diagram describing how this queue-based uh, system works. Uh, on the top, you see uh, the different, those four queues I just described. And then on the bottom, are the, the middle tier is the service stack. Uh, which reads and processes all the messages in the queue. So the, the very first step of the encoding workflow is the encoding request, right? So when that video gets ingested and processed by our system, an uh, automatic message gets created for an encoding request. So what happens there is essentially a message gets created that says, hey, this, this video asset resides on this location in our data center. Um, and that file gets uploaded into the cloud into object storage. So we take that file from our on-prem data center and send it off into the cloud uh, for further processing. So once that video file gets uploaded, that message in the first uh, queue gets destroyed and uh, a set of new messages gets created in the second part of the queue, which is the actual encoding queue. So the messages that get created here describe all the attributes and characteristics that we need to encode for each video and for the different platforms that they reside on. As you guys know, you know, you need a different set of uh, encoding settings for uh, Android, iOS, uh, iPad, you know, various different connected devices like an Xbox or a PlayStation and so on and so forth. So each uh, one of those platforms has its own message created. And when that message gets created, on the service stack, we have a bunch of worker nodes that are essentially sitting there monitoring the queue, waiting for a new job to come in. They go and pick up that, that message from the job. The message contains the path or the, the keys to where uh, the actual video asset resides in uh, object storage. It pulls it down locally, encodes the video to the specific parameters for that platform, and then it goes ahead and uploads the uh, encoded output back into object storage and then those messages get destroyed. And a new set of messages gets created in the third queue, which is the delivery queue. Uh, and this, this part is fairly simple. So the, the messages in this queue describe, hey, where does this file reside right now, i.e. the key and object storage for the encoded outputs, and B, where am I sending this? To a CDN, to my own, uh, on, my own on-premise origin? Or you know you may be in a shop that has multiple CDM providers, you know a level three and Akamai, a CloudFront, so on and so forth. So w whatever your your uh, your delivery output is, you want to describe that, and uh, you also want to describe the methodology by which you're going to be transporting the file. You know some endpoints may accept FTP or require SFTP, or you may use something like Aspera for uh, video delivery. You know it's a protocol replacement type of thing there. Uh, and basically, the nodes there are monitoring those messages. They get delivered to you know, whatever CDN or endpoint you're working with. Those messages are destroyed, and then one last final message is created, which is an update message that goes ahead and updates our database, saying that, hey, this file is now uploaded to the CDN. It's ready to play, and here's how you access it. So all that's updated in our database and then the video becomes available on all our owned and operated platforms. So one of the, the key uh, important uh, features of this type of workflow is the stateless nature of it. So you know when you're working with cloud-based platforms, you may 
lose a machine, there may be an outage, something happens, there's a hiccup. This is flexible enough where it's completely stateless. If a task gets failed, once that, that visibility timeout expires for the message, it just goes back to the queue. And then another node, when it gets to it, will, will pick up that, that message again and try the process again. Uh, number two, uh, the important tenet of scalability. So, you know, we're dealing with a very large uh, catalog of all our videos. And we, when we have to do something like re-encode our entire catalog for a, speci a specific platform that, you know, has some quirks or only supports a specific streaming protocol or only supports a very specific uh, set of encoding profiles that you need to use, we need to go back and re-encode everything. And we had to do that for this, um, this TV project. We had to prepare the files in a particular way that we weren't doing at present for our VOT, VOD content. So uh, it's important to be able to scale out your encoding fleet. And what we did was we scaled them out horizontally. And you can go from having 10 worker nodes on an average day to tens of thousands of worker nodes when you need to get a big project done. So we were actually able to re-encode all our video assets in roughly three days or so, which was a very important uh, business requirement. And finally, uh, the maintainability of the system is, is really key here. Uh, you know, the, the workflow that we have in place is very repeatable. Uh, you know, when we fleshed out the requirements that we needed for this TV project, uh, we were able to just create a new profile and plug that in into the encoding step of the actual uh, workflow, which was simply, in our case, updating an XML manifest that had all the different encoding profiles listed. So there was very minimal code rewrite that had to go on there. I mean, yeah, there was a lot of testing we had to do to select the right platform and use the right settings, but once we decided that information and figured out all that out, it was very simple to maintain and just update the system in that one simple way and now everything passing through the workflow was uh, creating a newly encoded output for a TV. So a little bit about the video encoding settings themselves. Nothing you see here is like terribly important on its own, but you'll notice there's one little trend there that there's constant in front of almost everything here. So we had to have constant bit rate, constant frame rate, uh, a fixed aspect ratio. And you know, if you're dealing with content that varies uh, you know, over, over large time spans, like for music videos, for instance, we have some older Madonna content that was uh, delivered to us in four by three that was you know, originally created for SD broadcast transmission over uh, television networks. And now everything is super HD quality, 16 by nine, right? So your, your system really has to be flexible enough to have some decision making baked into it, where I can say, oh, this is four by three, I need to pillar box this video. Or, oh, this is 16 by nine, do I need to have letter boxing here? And the whole uh, point of that is so that we can maintain a fixed aspect ratio. So all the VOD content that we're pre preparing here is going through a broadcast encoder, which we'll uh, elaborate on a little bit more later on in the discussion. But it's important to have uh, broadcast safe colors where where possible. Uh, you want to maintain in that safe range of colors so you still have that fidelity and you know the, that the quality of it is as intended so you're not seeing artifacts and strange things like that that broadcast encoders aren't typically um, set up to handle. On the audio side uh, we decided to go with you know basic AAC uh, audio codec which is fairly standard in the industry and of course a constant audio bit rate I uh, believe we are set at 128 kilobits and a constant sampling rate. Uh, we ended up using 44.1 kilohertz. So once again, just to emphasize, live video encoders, they're expecting consistent settings for the entire stream. So the takeaway here is constant everything. You know, when you're, at, when you're doing like an actual live broadcast, such as at a sporting event or something, you know, those live encoders are all set up with one set of settings and everything's passing through it. Since we're actually trying to mimic this with VOD content that varies on a case-by-case -case basis, we had to re-encode everything to maintain uh, a steady set of uh, encoding settings. 
So in this diagram here, uh, you'll see on the top part of the diagram, I don't know, it's a little flushed out, but you'll see in roughly the last 15 seconds or 450 frames or so, um, there's a huge drop off in bit rate. And this is in a VBR encoding uh, scenario for VOD. And what actually happened with this particular video is, you know, the, the video has a lot of motion and action, explosions, whatever. And then at the end, there was like an end card where it's kind of like credits, you know, copyright, blah, blah, blah. It's essentially a black screen with some text, right? So you're going from a lot of high motion down to almost nothing. So in a VOD setting, you wouldn't expense a lot of frames or uh, you wouldn't expense a, a high bit rate for these frames because there's so little action in it. But in a situation like we're trying to achieve for live broadcast, you really can't have that, that fluctuation from high bit rate, in this case 5,200 kilobits, down to almost nothing like 17 kilobits. That will cause problems in a live broadcast environment where you know, your broadcast encoder may think that, oh, the signal's over or the event is over and it's ending or that it's lost a signal and you know, aberrant, unintended behaviors happen. So on the second part of the diagram is the exact same video that we um, encoded with various CBR uh, settings. And what we did here was uh, we stuffed frames into the end of the video where there was no action just to fill the bit rate up. So now, while it's not completely flat, and you'll never completely achieve that just because of various you know, buffering settings and things like that that need to happen on the playback. And uh, we've gotten very close to having a consistent uh, bit rate with very little fluctuation. The only drawback to this is that the, the video file that we had to stuff frames into is now slightly larger. So, you know, this just goes to illustrate the difference between scenario A for VOD, you want a smaller file. Scenario B, we need to keep the settings consistent, so our file is slightly larger. Uh, you can use something like FF Pro, which is uh, an open source tool to extract bitrate information about the iframes or keyframes in your uh, video asset. And you can just plot that data and then search or mine that data for, for issues that, that you may see. And it kind of varies on a case by case basis, but once you analyze your own catalog, you'll see there's kind of a sweet spot in terms of the size of the packets in the frame. And when that size drops off over a cliff, it'll really fall over a cliff. And then that's when you know that, hey, I need to take some corrective measure here. Um, the, the great benefit of this is that uh, it's very easy to script out and automate. So you, know, you can just write a bash script or loop through your entire catalog of videos to find the problem areas. And once again, it's open source. So you, know, you don't have to worry about any licensing. OK, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about metadata here. So you remember all that metadata that we're ingesting uh, from our content partners about you know, the, the descriptive information about the actual video asset. We need a way to access that information. So the, the key takeaway here is that it's very important to standardize around a, a GUID or a unique identifier for every uh, video in your catalog. You know, uh, in the music industry, that unique identifier is an ISRC. But you could just think of it something akin to like an ASIN number or a UPC. And on the left-hand side, you'll see like a debug flash player. And it's a little difficult to see, but the green text is the metadata that's embedded into the actual stream. And the part that's highlighted is like the track name information. And then there's a GUID in there somewhere where uh, it's a little bit lower on in the diagram. but. Essentially, you'll be able to use this GUID to then do further processing on the playback side. An example is I can grab that GUID and then go look up what the artist or director is or the show title or in this case, uh, video music title. So, you know, once again, the unique identifier should be a property of every single video in your, uh, in your entire catalog. And uh, you want to actually capture that information in the smile manifest, which I'll talk about. Uh, shortly, and the, the data should be passed to the encoder for embedding into the actual MPEG transport stream. Um, an example on flash play playback, uh, every time the on metadata event fires, and you can have this fire on like a small interval, like two or three seconds, um, you, your player then can listen for these events, capture that information, and then go off and make like a REST API call to your own data layer, and then extract all the information about it. 
Okay, so, so far we talked about how the videos arrive to us, how we process them, ingest them, and how we uh, upload, encode and upload the video assets to our storage origin. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the playlisting and programming aspect of it. So uh, down here you'll see a small example of a smile manifest. Uh, it's fairly standard XML. You have your XML namespace in there. Uh, the metabase property, which describes your streaming property. And then uh, each node or each yellow line, or the two yellow lines you see in succession, uh, represent a video asset. So I know it's a little hard to see, but you see the GUID is in yellow, and then the location of that file on the storage origin. And what we do is we generate these lists in our long blocks so they can be processed. Uh, for scheduling, it's important to have uh, clean playback durations. So you want to be able to program your 24-hour stream in something like hour-long blocks or half-hour-long blocks. And from the programming side of it, OK, I want to select these 15 music videos to fill this hour-long block. But I was short on the last seven minutes. So now I need to find something that's you know, seven minutes or six minutes or 50 seconds to fill that spot. And you'll only ever be able to do that if you have clean uh, playback duration time. And this should all be cataloged from that ingestion process that we discussed earlier on. And it may not be such a small issue if you have a, a smaller, it may not be such a big issue if you have a smaller catalog and your playlists tend to be shorter. But if you're doing 24 hours of programming, you can imagine you may have, I don't know, 200 assets, 300 assets in that playlist. And if they're all off by like a couple seconds, you'll start to get time drift where, you know, hey, this video was supposed to be playing at 10 minutes to the hour, and now it's playing five minutes after the hour. So, you know, why do we care so much about this? Not only is it important for scheduling, but it opens the door for other interesting time-based uh, interactions you can have with the viewer. So, you know, think of something like annotations on, on a video, you know, uh, uh, certain scenes playing in the video, and then, oh, did you know that Lady Gaga stumbled down the steps and broke her foot, like Rob broke his foot, uh, <laughs> at two minutes and 37 seconds into you know, this, this particular video, and stuff like that. Uh, you can also introduce other interesting opportunities with uh, monetization, uh, if you know specifically where you are with time codes to things. You know, uh, Part in the music video, somebody may be drinking a soda product, and then you can have sponsored by da 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 advertiser, right? So knowing where you are and having the durations is super important for timing and scheduling and things like these type of interactions that that uh, are time based. And uh, now I'm going to hand it off to Rob, uh, who's going to tell you a little bit more about the broadcast encoding side of it. So you know we discussed the getting the music videos encoded, or getting the video assets encoded, and now we're going to talk about uh, how they're all packaged. Thank you, Ivan. So I'm going to walk you through four parts. Uh, the first one is the preparation, getting it from a file sitting on a hard drive somewhere into a live stream. We'll then get into transcoding of that file, of that stream, uh, repackaging. I'll explain what that is and get to that in a little bit. And finally, delivery of that to the end user. So let's get started. First thing we have is preparation. And the takeaway here is to start with the highest quality source you can. In Ivan's case, they were lucky. They have access to the labels that can give them the music videos, you know, either directly off tape or on some very high quality digital. Uh, in my example here is 50 megabits a second. It's a very large file. It will take you way too long to be able to copy that around or move that where you have to or edit it. So we do what's called making a mezzanine file. And that file is taking that huge 50 megabit trans uh, file that you get as your original source. And we're going to take that and turn that into, in my example here, a 5 megabit version of that same file. So we're still full HD. We're still using a very large file. Uh, one of the notes here, the highest customer offered bit rate. So in this example, Vivo TV would be topping out at 5 megabits per second full HD. And that's where we decided to put the line. We're then going to take this mezzanine file, and we're going to go ahead and make smaller versions of it. So that process is called transcoding. But before we get to that, we still have these files. There's still MP4 files sitting on hard drive somewhere. And we wrote a little piece of code, it was Adobe code, that 
took the file and played it out as a live stream. So we've gone from Ivan's, you know, from the music industry's large digital format into our mezzanine file, and now we're taking that file and turning it into a stream, which gets us, as I said, to the transcoding of it. So in this example, we have one large five megabit stream. It's a, it's a window, it's about this big. And if you can get five megabits wherever you are, it would be great and we could just serve that to everyone. But as we all know, we have to make smaller versions and smaller versions and smaller versions to be able to hit different network conditions. Uh, in Vivo TV, we use the MediaXL hero boxes to do this transcoding. And I leave this as a note that it's a very CPU or GPU heavy process and that you can't just throw it on a box in a corner and expect it to kind of grind through and work. It, it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of cycles, a lot of instances of, of a cloud, things like that. Um, so then the next question is, OK, we're going to take this big one and we're going to make them smaller. Well, how much smaller do we make them, and, and where and how? And unfortunately, it depends, which is always the answer. But the goal is to get the best looking rendition. That's ultimately what you're doing here. It's not about saving this or that. It's about it looking good to the customer. Um, so one of the tips I have here is that the screen resolution is no longer a viable metric. What I mean by that is that a 5-inch Android phone can now have the same, t uh, same amount of pixels in it, and it's the same 1080p that the 85-inch projector has. So when you ask somebody, oh, what resolution is that? It doesn't really give you an indication of how much data to send them. Because the screen size could still be very tiny. And you're not going to notice on you know, an iPhone 8 even whether it was you know, almost HD or HD, because it's only four or five inches big. Um, and lastly, the graphics and CPUs in devices these days are not the headache that they used to be. We used to have a problem where you just tried to play a video on, let's say, a Motorola Razr. And you just had to keep the CPU under 100. And if you could somehow magically do that, you could do some you know, choppy at best video playback. Now there's chips in the phones. They are especially there just to decode audio and video. And it, you can free up your CPU for the things Ivan was talking about, like putting up an ad on top of the video or displaying artist and you know, album information. Uh, so to this point, we've taken our stream and we've made it into, let's say, five different quality levels. So we had one 5 meg, now we have a 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. And we have to go into packaging of them. So what is packaging? It basically takes the video, it puts a head and a tail on it, and makes it what's called a container. Uh, some of the containers you might be aware of are Smooth, HLS, HDS, RTMP. These are all different vendors' ways of dealing with the video. Um, it would be great if we just had one way. Again, the standards would be you know, easy, we could all move on with our lives, but we're not there yet. We have ways that Apple, Adobe, and Microsoft all differently send the same video. So literally, the same frame of video of a dog on a skateboard is being created five different times for quality levels. We're now going to make, let's say, three more of those because we're going to repackage that same quality level three different ways depending on the device that you're going to use to consume it. And all of these methods have their you know, positives and minuses. And, all those kind of things. But I put a last point there that future standardization remains an issue. We had this problem 10 years ago. Uh, it was real player and Windows media streaming and those kind of things. Uh, we had it five years ago. We still have it now. I don't expect it to go away in the immediate future. So repackaging is probably something you're going to have to take a look at. Continuing on, we now need to deliver these now 15 versions. We have our 5 meg. We turned those into 5. And then we made three versions of each of those. So we're now ca carrying around 15 versions of the same picture, ultimately. Um, so we need to actually get it to the devices now. For mobile playout, we uh, basically we say that you need to take these 15 and decide how you're going to use them and where you're going to use them. I'm going to jump ahead one slide to give you a quick look. Uh, if we look over here. This says low bit rate, and that says high bit rate. And it's hard to see on this projector, but as you go down this list, you're getting to more complicated video. It has higher data rates and larger screen sizes. So you would save maybe for an iPhone, let's take these three, because the person might be traveling. They might be on 3G. You never know what kind of conditions you're going to have. Um, I'll come back to this in a little bit when we get to the home connected devices. But that's generally what computers see when they go to make these decisions, and, and we'll go a little more into that. Uh, 
So we might make a different, what's called a manifest, for an iPhone or an iPad or an Android device because of the different conditions that we expect them to be viewed in and the size of the screen and all of these different considerations that we make. Uh, there are people that just make apps for one or two platforms. And if you're making apps for, let's say, uh, I have an example lower down here, the, the Roku. Roku has very specific encoding parameters. And if you are only targeting Roku with your app, then just call them and ask them what they should be and take all the guesswork out of it. Same for, you know, if you're making a PlayStation app or an Xbox app, it's all, it's all the same stuff. Um, so if you're targeting, call them. If you're just trying to hit everything, we're, you're going to be sitting here and making some of these manifests deciding on where and how you're doing things. Uh, when we get to the TV attached further down, you'll see that the assumption here is that these things are physically connected, or at least over Wi-Fi, but they're on home internet. You're probably not on the bus watching your you know, Apple TV, uh, and that they have, they're attached to larger screens. So with those two assumptions, we can give them higher levels. And again, I'll go back to this manifest. Here you can see, by the way, I really did break my foot. That's why I'm in sneakers. But here you can see the, uh, the home devices could potentially start here. Because we don't have to think, oh, maybe they're on the bus and they're going to get a really poor version. We can start them here and go all the way up to a, to a full HD encode. So these are some of the differences that you can see as you have more information as to where people are and you can target them. And these are all things that you know, we had to, to look into on a Vivo TV given the number and different size of devices that, that we've been using. So lastly, we need to do something with this. We now have these 15 files and they're all good and we've made all our manifests, but we need to get it to the user. And this is where things get interesting. We can uh, send it to a CDN of our choice. You could even send it to an MSO or MVPD. Those are like cable and satellite companies. Uh, I've added up here that you can send it to cellular companies. You can use it during live events. It's, it's a video signal. The thing that we have made for Vivo TV is a video signal. And we've then chosen to go ahead and make it into live streams and put it on the internet. We could have backed up to that TV signal, uh, to that video signal, and decided to put it in different places. So with that, I want to say thank you to everyone. And uh, we'll take some questions or whatever you guys would like to talk about. Please go ahead. So the, the idea was that at w we're feeding files into an encoder effectively through this uh, little uh, piece of code that we wrote. And that transcoder, when it would drop that low, would, would think that the live stream had been pulled. I mean, going you know, at orders of magnitude down. Is that the source or the output from the broadcast encoder? That is the output of the broadcast encoder. But that would also be the source. Because in, in the VBR, it would drop it to the floor, and the encoder would then panic and say, wait, I just lost signal. I only have 17K of data. It's probably just noise, because it was getting almost 5 megs for so long. And the encoder can't push out VBR? The encoder, the, the live encoder had trouble reading the dropped out VBR. So when we used CBR, we were able to it basically didn't panic anymore, if you will. And we were able to kind of continue on. And it was just part of sanitizing all those files and getting everything ready. You know, it was just thousands and thousands of files that had to end up being made exactly the same way. And just to elaborate on that a little bit more, with, with the VOD content, I mean, with VBR, you're typically getting the smaller file sizes. So, you know, it, it's better to have that when, when possible because, you know, I don't need to have this many bits for a low motion scene where I'd rather save those bits for that huge car explosion chase scene, right? So, um, and, and the other point is to kind of, on, on the VOD aspect, when possible, you want to respect the uh, original, uh, you know, or the mezzanine files that, that were sent to us. You, you, you want to respect those uh, original settings as much as possible. But, you know, on the, the live broadcast side, you know, typically in a real live event, it's just one, one, uh, group of settings that are not fluctuating from, uh, well, there, there is no, there, in the live broadcast, it's just one contiguous stream, right? And in this context where 
achieving that, but with different VOD assets, right? So uh, on a typical, on a typical um, playlist, you could have, oh, these 20 videos had 20 completely different video settings, which it's essentially to achieve that on the broadcast side, you'd have to readjust those settings for, for the proper output uh, and playback <coughs> on the broadcast encoder after each clip, which really isn't something sustainable or something that you want to get into the business of. So really, the, the whole concept is sanitize everything coming into it into one uniform group of settings, whatever they may be, um, you know, whatever best suits your, your particular situation, and then feed that through the broadcast encoder.